Hydrogen is the simplest of all atoms, and so it makes sense to begin our survey of the main group elements with the hydrogen atom. Hydrogen contains only a single proton and a single electron, which makes it the smallest atom in addition to being the simplest, but it has a fairly rich chemistry. And one of the most interesting things about hydrogen is that we can think of it as belonging in group 1 or group 1A or group 17 with the halogens. And to understand why this is the case, we only need to think about the fact that hydrogen's valence shell is the N equals 1 shell, and it contains one electron as a neutral atom. So hydrogen is like the alkali metals in that it has a single electron in its valence shell. But hydrogen is like the halogens in that it is one electron away from having a full valence shell. So if, for example, that one electron is lost, then we end up with an empty N equals 1 level, and the chemical species here is simply a proton, H+. However, if hydrogen gains an electron from something that can donate an electron to it, it ends up with a completely full valence shell, and we end up with the species H-, which in a sense is analogous to a halide anion like bromide, chloride, fluoride, with a full valence shell and a formal charge of negative one. In compounds with highly electronegative elements, things like fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen, hydrogen behaves more like an alkali metal in that it has, it has a partial positive charge. In compounds of metallic elements, group one and group two, for example, hydrogen behaves more like a halogen because it's more electronegative than the other bonding partner, and so it has a partial negative charge and more electron density on the hydrogen atom as opposed to the metallic bonding partner. We've seen plenty of cases where H plus is relevant in the context of Bronsted acids, but I want to impart that thinking of hydrogen in this form as what's called hydride is going to be important as well, especially as we start talking about bonds between metals and hydrogen. The so-called binary hydrides contain hydrogen with just one other element, and we can divide them into three general classes based on differences in electronegativity between the atoms involved and the resulting type of bonding that we observe. The first class are called the ionic hydrides, and you may hear these referred to as the saline hydrides as well. These typically involve group 1 or group 2 alkali metal or alkaline earth metal cations along with hydrogen. So the bonding here is ionic, and as a general formula we might write MH for the alkali metal hydrides, or MH2 for hydrides of the alkaline earth metals. When you see a formula like this with something like sodium or potassium here, or magnesium or calcium here, it's important to think of this as an ionic compound and do what we do with ionic compounds, which is imagining them as split into their component ions. So really it's best, particularly if this hydride is in solution, to think of this as not MH, but as M plus and H minus, with an ionic bond existing between the cation and the anion. Ditto for the alkaline earth metal hydrides. It's best to think of these as M2 plus and 2H minus, as opposed to simple MH2, which obscures the ionic nature of the compound. Binary hydrides of the transition metals are characterized as metallic hydrides. Like the alkali metals, the transition metals are not super electronegative. However, they don't surrender electrons to hydrogen to form hydride in the same way that alkali metals and alkaline earth metals do. So the situation for the metallic hydrides is a little bit more complicated. These are sometimes called interstitial hydrides. We've seen this term interstitial before in the context of alloys, Remember, in that context, we identified the interstices as the holes between atoms in a crystal structure. Hydrogen is the smallest atom, so it should feel intuitive that the extremely tiny hydrogen atoms can nestle into, into the interstices in, for example, a transition metal crystal structure. And this is exactly the structure of the transition metal metallic hydrides in this figure. The blue circles correspond to the transition metal atoms, while the red dots, which are of course much smaller because hydrogen is the smallest element and the transition metals are in rows four and below, correspond to hydrogen atoms. The nature of bonding in metallic hydrides isn't well understood, and 
because the hydrogen atoms occupy interstices in the crystal structure and may do so in a somewhat irregular way, we end up, in some cases, with what are called non-stoichiometric compounds, compounds with weird subscripts in their empirical formulas. For example, the metallic hydride of titanium has the empirical formula TiH1.7, indicating that we don't have a clean whole number ratio between the numbers of titanium and hydrogen atoms in the structure. Within the main group, the largest class of hydrides are the covalent hydrides. And these are found for most group 13 to group 17 elements in the P block of the periodic table. As the name suggests, these hydrides are characterized by one or more covalent bonds between hydrogen and generally an electronegative non-metallic element, I'll just abbreviate that as A here, key point is that this is a covalent bond, and since we're talking about the P block on the right-hand side of the periodic table, the typical situation is that A is more electronegative than the hydrogen atom, leaving the hydrogen atom with a partial positive charge. Contrast this with the ionic hydride situation in which the hydrogen atom was, in some cases, fully formally negatively charged, while the metal cation was positive. Here, the electron density distribution is flipped, in a sense. Examples of the covalent hydrides in the p-block include compounds like BH3, which actually dimerizes spontaneously to form B2H6, CH4, methane, NH3, ammonia, H2O, water. These are some of the most familiar compounds from everyday life. The non-metal covalent hydrides are extremely common. Even as we move down the periodic table within the main group, to, to elements that are more metallic in their elemental form, we still end up with covalent hydrides. Great examples of this are SNH4, 10,4 hydride, or stannane, GEH4, which is known as germane, SIH4, which is known as silane, so on and so forth. With the exception of a couple of hydrides whose existence is uncertain at this point, all of the hydrides within the p-block are covalent hydrides. As we've alluded to so far, the key to identifying whether a hydride is ionic, metallic, or covalent, is to focus on, first of all, whether the other bonding partner is a group 1 or 2 metal, a transition metal, or a non-metal. But secondly, and this is important for getting at some of the more subtle differences between the types of hydrides, we want to focus on the difference in electronegativity between hydrogen and the other element. For something like NaH, for example, there's a huge difference in electronegativity here, and the more electronegative atom is the hydrogen. This tells us straight away that that hydrogen is bearing considerable negative charge. It's pulling the electrons in sodium hydride towards itself, and so it's best to think of this not as covalent NaH, but as an ionic compound consisting of Na plus and H minus. On the other hand, in something like H2O, water, the covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen is highly polarized toward the electronegative oxygen atom. That leaves the hydrogen partially positive. It's important to be able to make these kinds of judgments about electron density in the hydrides. In the covalent hydrides that are further down in the p-block, we end up with somewhat ambiguous situations. For example, silane is definitely a covalent hydride. The SiH bond is highly covalent. However, silicon and hydrogen have similar electronegativities. In many cases, SiH4 and related compounds containing SiH bonds can behave like hydrides. That is, they can behave like H- and SiH3+, almost like a metallic hydride, even though the bond is covalent. We can essentially think of the SiH bond polarized towards hydrogen. It's a covalent bond, it's just polarized in the opposite direction because of the different electronegativity difference. We're now going to transition into talking about synthesizing hydrogen-containing compounds and reactions thereof. So we have three strategies that we're going to discuss for synthesizing hydrogen-containing compounds. The first is direct combination of an elemental form of a substance with H2. For the most part, these are redox processes, as we'll see. The second is protonation of a Bronsted base. And this is definitely a process we've seen before. You may not have thought of it as a strategy for synthesizing hydrogen-containing compounds, but in fact, it is. If we can supply something that can donate a proton to a different species, 
then the transfer of that proton generates a new hydrogen-containing compound. So this is actually a great strategy for synthesizing hydrogen-containing compounds, provided the other fragment is basic enough to pick off a proton. The third method is what's known as metathesis or double displacement. This is similar to the protonation idea, except rather than transferring H+, as would happen in the protonation case, we're transferring H-. And we think of this as metathesis since H- is acting like an anion that's traded from one cation to another. Direct combination of the elements can involve combination of hydrogen with a nonmetal or a metal. In both of these cases, the basic idea is a redox process in which we're transforming the elemental form, which has an oxidation state of zero, to a product which has an oxidation state either greater than or less than zero, depending on whether we transferred hydride formally or a proton. When hydrogen combines with a non-metal, good example is the combination of hydrogen with elemental chlorine, the resulting product is typically a covalent hydride, since the non-metal is in the P block of the periodic table, and the resulting covalent bond is polarized towards the non-metal atom. That is, hydrogen has a partial positive charge, and the nonmetal a partial negative charge. Just to emphasize that this is a redox process, notice that we start with hydrogen in an oxidation state of zero and chlorine in an oxidation state of zero, and the chlorine has transformed into an oxidation state of minus one, while the hydrogen has transformed to an oxidation state of plus one. When hydrogen and a metal combine, the result is typically an ionic hydride. A good example of this is the combination of H2 with sodium metal. We need two of these to balance H2, and the resulting product is sodium hydride solid, NaH. This compound involving an alkali metal and hydrogen is an ionic hydride. We know that because it's really Na plus H minus, right? And again, we can think of this as a redox process. H and Na start out with oxidation state of zero. In the products, Na has been oxidized to form Na plus with an oxidation state of plus one, while H2 has been reduced to H minus with an oxidation state of minus one. The second strategy to form hydride compounds is protonation of Bronsted bases. Our second strategy for synthesizing hydrogen containing compounds involves protonation of Bronsted bases. So in all of these examples, we're going to need some acid that's able to donate a proton to our Bronsted base. A simple example might involve hydroxide, as the Bronsted base. Hydroxide acts as the electron donor or Lewis base here, if you like, also a Bronsted base donating towards hydrogen, pulling off the proton and leaving the two electrons in HA to head towards A. The resulting products are the new hydrogen containing compound, in this case H2O, and the conjugate base of the acid A-, which has gained a new lone pair. We can also use this strategy to synthesize charged hydrogen containing compounds. One example involves the Lewis base trimethylamine in CH33, which has a Lewis basic lone pair, and again this acid which we need to transfer the proton. Provided the acid is strong enough, the proton transfer in this case leaves us with, once again, the conjugate base of the acid, A-, and now a positively charged hydride containing a new NH bond, covalent bond, along with everything else that was there, the three methyls, and a positive charge on the nitrogen atom. Notice in both of these cases that we started with a hydrogen-containing compound, and what occurred in the acid was cleavage of the HA bond. We're going to talk about this as an important paradigm for reactions of, in particular, covalent hydrides of the electronegative nonmetals, Cl, Br, oxygen, in a little bit. Our final strategy is called metathesis or double displacement. And these reactions, in contrast to the last set of examples, involve hydride transfer rather than proton transfer. In these reactions, we start with a reactant that's happy to give away hydrogen as a hydride, something typically that contains an alkali metal or an alkaline earth metal cation and a hydride anion or related compound that can donate hydride. So an example of this might be something like LiAlH4, which looks a bit odd until we realize that this is really Li plus AlH4 minus, and the entire AlH4 minus anion acts like a hydride donor. It has the ability to donate H minus to form the more stable AlH3. 
this compound can combine with some other metal containing fragment. Let's just think about a generic metal complex, MLN. L are the ligands, M the central metal, N the number of ligands. Let's imagine it has a positive charge. We can think of this process like the hydride anion, and I'll put quotes around it because it's not exactly this way, but this will suffice for our purposes, being donated as a Lewis base to the Lewis acidic metal center in MLN+. The resulting product includes the transferred hydrogen, now bonded to MLN, and this might be a coordinate covalent bond, actually. That may be the best way to think about it. It's now neutral since we've transferred H- to MLN+. And over here in the hydride donor, we're left with Li+, and AlH3. Now, why is this called a metathesis or double displacement reaction if it seems we've only transferred hydride? Well, of course, we're going to have some counter ion coming along with this metal complex, and that counter ion is now associated with Li+, really. And so we have done a double displacement. One of the hydrides in LiAlH4 has been transferred to the metal complex, while the counter ion, which used to be associated with the metal complex, has now been transferred to Li+.